I think we, we're going to see it's like the the e-brake thing. Once that eighty percent e-brake gets dropped down, and we can we can finally get going again, we're going to go really really far. It's I, I hate to get too utopian because you end up just saying everything's going to be great and it's going to be an awesome time. But I like to be a bit more grounded and realistic. But it, it's maybe it's Jeff Booth's thing. It's really hard to even imagine what it will look like because we've only known living under this. So hey, Owen, welcome to the show. Hi. How are you doing? Thank you. Yeah, good. Thanks. Looking forward to this conversation. Yeah, really looking forward to that. Um, Owen, yeah. So um, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit? Um, I, I stumbled upon your um, one of your tweets. Um, I couldn't find it today. I don't know for what reason. Uh, um, it was about uh, uh, you made a tweet, a pretty interesting tweet about the aviation uh, technology, aviation industry and uh, the connection to the uh, fiat standard. So yeah, why don't you just uh, give my listeners a little bit about your background? Um, I know your engineering uh, background, so I have a, mm -hmm. like an overview. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so uh, I'm a mechanical design engineer by trade, a CAD designer most of the time. Uh, so I worked in the automotive industry for about 10 years uh, for various car companies around the UK. Um, now I'm I've moved away from that a little bit. Now I'm working for a Bitcoin company, but I won't go into that. I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to disclose. Um, but it's interesting to look at Bitcoin through this engineering lens. And I think that's what really kind of like got me over the hill with it uh, to really appreciate the the power of this thing. Uh, when I saw the engineering and how things put together and like the, the integrity behind the design. And then as you start researching the field and listening to st stuff like Sabine's podcast and things, you start to see, you start to look at um, the world through that that kind of clearer uh, financial lens of Bitcoin and you kind of see the other problems that are evident and then how we might do things differently. And so I think that's what led to the the tweet that you you liked where, where Safedin was talking about um, supersonic uh, passenger jets like Concorde. I think most people will be familiar with Concorde. Um, and most people I think are aware that it kind of existed for a time and it, it it flew and worked and was in public service and then kind of disappeared at some point and there was some controversy around uh accidents and things and what exactly happened but i don't think a lot of people realize the the long story behind it so we we, we we know that humanity and you know private industry has the ability to do supersonic travel it's not a thing reserved for the military it is possible and has been done but we don't do it anymore and no one really kind of understands or thinks about why um, and so in prepping for this, I did some research on the background of Concord, and I think it's a really interesting story to talk about um, how it came about and why it went away. And it really reflects looking at it all through the Bitcoin lens, like things become crystal clear as to what a mess you can get yourself into uh, with kind of government financial meddling and stuff like this. And then, you know, where where might the world be with less of that and more of private industry just getting on with things with sound money? So. We can get into that when you're when you're ready. If we finish with the preamble, I think that's a good starting point for the conversation. Yeah, excellent start part. So, um, so what I think what you're alluding to is also the uh, uh, you know what the fuck happened 1971, right? Right. So <laughs> the the yeah. deep pegging or I don't know the uh, going off the gold standard, going into a full blown you know debt bubble uh, under Nixon. Uh, and that's where everything went south. Everything went down. I mean, you can just see it on on, on the graphs. I mean, the numbers, the data, the the facts speak for themselves. So um, again, going back to Safid and Amuz and his um, um, you know elaborations and studies and the podcast he did on ep the episodes he did with I think with one or two experts. Uh, because uh, Safina, I think he also uh, looked at the uh, different like a range of. Um, um, like the flight time, like from one city to another, let's say, for example, like New York, Los Angeles. And, and, and he was so uh, astonished that, that uh, first of all, that uh, the aviation industry trends, trans, uh, what do you call it, regressed, uh, in, you know, in the early 70s. And uh, the speed of the, of the airplanes um, uh, just, just uh, diminished uh, uh, to, to a massive extent. Um, so, yeah, this is something where where I'm like really mind boggled because uh, when you look back into history with the Wright brothers, it, was it 1903? Uh, they weren't even physicists or or uh, you yeah. know. They, I think they were high school dropouts. 
they were they had a bicycle shop <laughs> so they were the ones you know who went into trial and error and 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 started you know uh, building and testing and 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 finally you know i mean uh, it took a time until we had a commercial aviation industry i think it took like approximately 30 years but uh yeah i just just um um uh, why don't you? I don't know. Uh, give, give give us your thoughts. Like uh, maybe also uh, within the historical perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, those were like I think they were bicycle repairmen, and they, that, this is just people like messing around in their shed, trying to build something and see see what they can come up with that works. And that's like how you start sort of doing battle with the laws of physics. You just have to try stuff and see what works. And it's not always uh, um, academic research and things that, that can push the boundaries. Sometimes it's just guys just messing around and seeing, seeing what happens. Some, so some of the best stuff comes out that way. Um, and that, if you think about it, that's all sort of private ventures. Those are just people doing things they're interested in. Sometimes it's because they think there's a business opportunity down the road somewhere. Sometimes it's just playing around and seeing what can happen. And that's, that's how kind of invention comes about. It's not centrally planned. It just sort of arises from, from, I don't know, the, the collective, uh, intelligence of all the members of the human species you know one guy has one idea over there and then someone else sees that and picks up on it and builds on it um i mean i think we should get into the, the kind of concord story because it's it's a really good example of of where the trajectory things could have taken and you know you, when you look at it through the bitcoin lens things kind of fall into place a lot more so it starts back in the 50s so we've had world war ii and uh, a lot of government funding went into uh aerospace development for that for obvious reasons for for the war and we we don't even need to talk about the economics of the war and why it happened and so on that's another story but it happened uh it finished and closed so in the 50s uh private industry started looking into whether they could do um supersonic planes uh, especially for for commercial flights and things so this is this is just a private kind of research and exploring the idea uh, then the uk government stepped in uh, to fund this research group and some of the very early concepts of sort of small planes like fighter kind of size to see what what really worked but this is when government started getting involved already so centrally planned money starts coming in to kind of push this concept forward a bit and you could argue that's a good thing because maybe it would have taken longer if it was left to private industry to kind of to fund all this stuff but anyway that's what happened um and then the uk government wanted to uh help push this into becoming a full a fully fledged you know passenger aircraft design uh, but they wanted partners for it so they kind of started speaking to uh us like boeing and airbus and things and french you know but these are still private companies but now with some sort of government funding shovel behind them and at the same time the us and the french governments were all keen for a, a plane of their own so all of the political entities were really keen on this technology and wanted to uh be able to proudly hold up the flag and say we we can fly faster than sound itself you know everyone wanted to be everyone was keen for this industry and wanted to keep pushing forward on it so that was the 50s so it started off private and then government money started coming in to push it because they wanted this sort of glory project and this is major nations all of them doing it in the 1960s uh the u.s kind of uh the, U the uk consulting with the u.s companies found that the US companies were kind of like shying away from it a little bit, like Boeing, they didn't really want to get involved with this multinational effort. And the presumption is because they felt the US government wouldn't really would be funding it and wouldn't really be, be approving of that funding going towards helping rival or you know friendly rival nations. Uh, so the US companies were kind of stepping away from the what became the Concorde product a bit. Um, the UK and the French agreed a partnership, governments still, so this is a national thing, they agreed uh they came up with an agreement to to work on this supersonic passenger jet concept but this, this is governments this is not private companies so there was all sorts of clauses and things this wasn't like an economic venture anymore this was politically driven and politically funded and then once that agreement was in place the u.s industry started panicking thinking the future is supersonic everyone's going to have faster than sound planes we're going to be behind europe has got this head start they've already got the program in place funding in place starting to work on it we're not even doing it yet so the u.s industry panicked and lent on president kennedy at the time to uh help them out and get the u.s government involved in pushing it on the private industry side in the u.s so they funded this design competition amongst all the private industries in the u.s and this is the bit that most people don't know about so that we know about concord and that's a fairly household name but the u.s had this competition to design their own version uh, and there were two early prototypes developed by 
Boeing and uh, Lockheed, I think. And these would, would look superficially similar to Concorde, but they were much bigger, like twice the size. So if you imagine, uh, I think Concorde flies something like 150, 160 passengers or so, the US versions would have been much bigger and able to transport up to 300 people at a time, faster than the speed of sound. So think of the uh, economies of scale that come into place when you've got bigger jets that can fly more people faster. The economy works better if you can build something like that. Um, when you say got so quite can far. I interrupt you, uh, Owen, when you say Lockheed, uh, was that like uh, within the military or was it a civilian project or or just civilian or... project still? Okay, but it's almost it, the kind of the feel of it is almost like a military project. I'm not saying it was at all, but you know the government set out what they wanted to be built in you know, the specifications of the plane or something, and gave the contract to various companies to kind of come up with a proposal, which they paid for. The government paid for come up with a proposal for what these planes. What a, what a something that does this job might look like, um, which is what they do for military contracts. So this is still kind of like coming from top down. This isn't industry saying we think customers would like this, and you know this is how we might produce something to fulfil that market. This is the government saying make this for us, please. Um, and then you know this is where things start to really go off the rails. So the US government continues to kind of like tweak the requirements all over the place and keep changing. So the the companies aren't left alone to figure out you know the um, the market isn't figuring out what it should be and how it should work and what's the most efficient way of doing it. The government is just saying, oh, actually, no, we want the range to be this. Oh, no, now it should be this. And, you know, changing, pulling the levers all the time. And so you're starting to add in uh, those inefficiencies because they're, they're not able to just go away and just do the work. They're, they're kind of trying to appease their, basically their one customer who's not really their customer. So that takes us through the 60s. And then the US prototypes uh, had full-scale mock-ups built. So things were getting pretty serious by this point. It wasn't a flying plane, but like they'd done a lot of the background work of what the plane might be like enough that they could present these big full scale models that you could walk inside. And so, um, the, the government was looking at these to kind of decide which one that's going to get funded. Uh, and then 1971 happens and you know, what the fuck happened in 1971? Well, one thing that happened in 1971 was, uh, Nixon was the president at the time canceled the the government funding for all the US projects on these jets, which basically just killed the thing completely in the US. So after shoveling tons of public money onto this project to try and like accelerate the time scale, they now kill it off. And so it just disappears off the face of the earth again. And this was serious business. Like uh, the US one had, I think, uh, 122 reservations from airlines who, who wanted this. Uh, the Concorde one, which was smaller, you know, and not as grand a scale of project, but still a big thing, had 75 reservation so there's like nearly 200 planes sales lined up that um, airlines wanted these and they were paying full market rate for them so the market wanted the product that was being developed uh, and then the government pulled the plug on the us and now now you're not having that anymore so that resulted in boeing was the was the winner of the competition they had to fire 60,000 people so 60,000 jobs gone um so you know the, the things are starting to come unraveled a bit here 1971 again so most orders were cancelled by 1973 uh concord was still going ahead um but like the economy at the time was making sales difficult because this is a thirsty plane you know it uses a lot of fuel not very many seats uh so it's 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 quite an unappealing kind of prospect for investment in this era but if we look at it through the bitcoin lens we recognize that so the economy is is largely driven by government actions at that time you've got a stock market crash in 1973 which we know we well we strongly feel we austrians strongly feel it comes from government manipulation driving the market up and down and up and down so you've got the, the market in a downtrend driven by the government at that point you've got an oil crisis at that time as well which is also political so that's driven by uh government actions as well um and this emerging trend of people preferring uh, cheaper ticket prices rather than valuing their time from the speed of the of the travel and that sounds a lot like kind of fiat issues if you think about it as well, isn't it? Um, so Concords went ahead and got built and flew and entered service as most people are vaguely familiar with, but they needed heavy government subsidies to even get into the air and going at all. So for airlines to go ahead and complete the purchase and start operating the planes needed more government funding shoveled on. So, and they ran for a while and then the program eventually discontinued and, and industry hasn't really pursued that anymore because they've specialized into these, you know, public transport style planes that are 
slow um but carry lots of lots of people and there's not been a lot of research into supersonic stuff which is there is some stuff starting to happen now with some new companies coming out which i can't talk much about because i just don't know that much about it but i know it is happening um but if you look back at that whole line of history what you've got is government emulation uh to drive the program that was already being undertaken so they kind of ramp it up and it works for a while and then they pull the plug and it crashes back down and then what we did have left was because the government sort of shoveled some more money in there to kind of get the thing running at all. So, and this is in the 70s. So this is just after pulling the plug on sound money as well. So what might that trajectory have looked like if we didn't have any of that at all? We, we know it started off with private industry. So people were interested in doing this. The market was interested in pursuing it. So, you know, there was a trajectory going on where it was being researched and looked into. If they didn't have the, the huge accelerationary push, perhaps... They would have just carried on that trajectory, sort of in a maybe in a more uh, realistic and long-term and sustainable way. You know, gradually moving this ball forward bit by bit, learning how, learning the physics and learning how to design planes. So this is much more complex than subsonic flight. Um, and then maybe maybe it would have taken longer to ramp up, but and maybe I don't know in the eighties or nineties or something we might have arrived at something like a Concorde. But at a time where uh, if you had not had the stock market crashes and oil crisis and all that stuff. Perhaps it would have it would have it would have arrived at the right time for it and then been able to keep going. But instead we've kind of like gone a, a wild kind of swings and then ended up kind of where we were at the beginning, but much, much poorer. So all everything seems to come back to uh economic policies and political policies and things, sort of just like exaggerating these swings and pushing things that the market didn't want yet or did want, but not in that way or something, and just not allowing the collective uh, intelligence of the the market and the the companies things to kind of arrive at the solutions and develop them and move forward by themselves organically. So I think things would have looked different if we hadn't followed that path and maybe we would have more, I mean, without fossil fuel based crises like the 73 oil crisis and stuff, we wouldn't have people so concerned about um, the amount of fuel these things use so it's not obvious but you use a lot more fuel to go a bit faster because you know air is um uh it just is harder and harder to push through the faster and faster you go so you have to throw more and more energy into it to get par get higher and higher speeds um that is that but, is if we're talking about like the classical combustion or propulsion system that uses um uh, you know so-called fossil fossil fuel gasoline uh, or kerosene or right no it's just a, a, a basic physics principle you know the drag i think is squared increases the the, the okay. to add you know you have to put the far you know for one mile an hour faster you have to put on you know significantly more energy and then another one another mile an hour faster significantly more energy again to get faster and faster because you know air is is a fluid really and if you imagine you know trying to move quickly through water you can kind of visualize it a bit more clearly like if you want to go really fast you have to actually take yourself out of the water that's how you get boats to go really fast not just if you want to stay in the fluid which you you have to do unless you want to leave the atmosphere or something in a plane then you have to throw a ton of energy into moving it and that's you know if the energy is cheap it's not really a problem but if the energy is expensive because of various market manipulations and things then it it uh, it kind of ruins the economies of the economics of the whole thing. So maybe that's enough for me. What where do you want yeah, to go from there? Yeah, no, that's good. Um, let me um, let me interject. Uh, so you talked about the political component, which which I can sometimes really make sense of. Because I mean, what, what's the incentive behind the political aspect? Is that like, I mean, I understand the political competition uh, because you talked about like you know it was more political, and then. Um, and then they, you know, they 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 pulled the plug, uh, you know, after seventy one. Um, I mean, did uh, did, but but within the military industrial complex, the the research, the technological innovation development, with it be you know uh, secretly or semi secretly, I mean, has been going on. I mean, there all these trillions that have been siphoned off, which I think also Catherine Austin Fitz also talks about, uh, you know, always in her interviews. Um, that's something, okay, we do not have public access to, you know, as you do not have, I don't have that. So, but, but just, just the, 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 the fact that we can see those, uh, you know, uh, those, uh, military, you know, transportation vehicles, whether it be submarines, uh, airplanes, 
any kind of transportation systems. I mean, they have those uh, much more advanced systems. So um, was it siphoned off or, you know, channeled into the military industrial complex? Or do you have any opinion on that? Uh, I think it's economics based mm -hmm. uh, because the the military side doesn't really need to make so much of a business case for for let's let's develop this technology or this this plane or this machine or whatever like if the the customer which is the government with the money printer says we want that technique we want that uh, functionality we want something that can do that job then as long as they can convince the guy who's pressing the button on the money printer to fund it then it happens whereas in private industry uh, you have to kind of like you have to appease a final customer who is a guy who's buying a seat on a plane to New York five years from now or, or whatever it is. Um, and then the other factor is that the the industry, the air, aerospace industry, to my knowledge, is sort of like a, has just a specialized down into the the dull public transport style uh, transportation. You know, the airliners as opposed to the supersonic stuff, um, because. It's 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 quite a risk to kind of start exploring this um this much faster stuff. It's you know you're really going a bit out there on the risk curve uh, to to develop. It's it's a big program to develop a new plane, and it's you can't kind of take what you've already got and just tweak the wings a bit or something like the whole thing has to be built for that purpose. Um, and in the economy that we have, where uh, everyone's feeling like um, tight with cash and things, it, there doesn't seem to be enough market interest in paying what it would cost. For that plane to to come about so they don't even steer their whole oil tanker of, of a company they don't even kind of like start turning in that direction because it's just too risky to explore so with the people who are exploring it now are small young startup type companies who are just revisiting things from the ground up and trying to do it like a, kind of like what tesla did with cars and you can think what you like about electric cars but the concept of a small startup company taking on a big industry by just approaching things from a clean sheet of paper and saying well i know what the outcome i want is how do we go about that rather than having to kind of steer their whole, you know, however many thousands of employees kind of departments into that direction. They just start going in the right direction from the first place. So we might see some interesting stuff in the next decade or so. Um, but especially if Bitcoin comes into things, it depends what happens with the with the economy and the fiat economy and everything, how these balances shift over time. But we might get to some more interesting stuff soon. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go into the rabbit hole of uh, connecting, you know, to the to the hyper-Bitcoinized world or the Bitcoin connection. Um, I mean, let's take a concrete example, Elon Musk. I mean, I have a lot of respect for entrepreneurs, you know, like full-blown entrepreneurs who do not get any governmental, you know, subsidies or military contracts. But let's let's just take, you know, for example, Elon Musk. I mean, uh, I don't know everything, but it's, it is it um, is a fact, right, that Elon Musk has been receiving and and uh, getting you know military contracts and governmental subsidies um i mean without that do you think uh he would have been able to you know go into all this direction would it be spacex or tesla or good question um i mean i know with tesla they i'm not so familiar with spacex but i know with tesla they did receive uh government subsidies and things and they kind of built that into the business model so they were, for a period of time they were selling carbon credits to other companies other car companies almost as much as they were selling cars to actual consumers and that's like just pure government manipulation stuff all the way down that's that's central planning stuff happening and they're making their business off of appeasing the government basically rather than actually producing stuff that people want to buy um but as i understand it i think they've paid back uh they might still be reliant on the carbon credit stuff to a degree but they've paid back a lot of the if not all of the investment and funding they had from the state so they're kind of like they're up and running and on their own steam a bit now, but I don't, I can't talk about it that extensively because I just don't know. Um, with SpaceX, it's, I don't know what the funding situation is, but they they have developed some. You know, their, their rockets are are useful things that that NASA kind of hasn't really been doing recently. And whether that's because they can't, or whether that's because the funding situation on the NASA side didn't didn't work as well, I don't know. But they have developed a, something that's useful to get stuff up into orbit for less money than it cost before. And this is sort of what private industry does. It's when we remove the central planning and just allow the, the combined brain power of the of the market to operate and, and devise a new solution, you get better stuff um, because they're able to figure out what do people actually want and where can I get the best deals and so on that you just don't get with central planning. Um, so it's interesting to kind of play the tape forward into the hopefully post 
hyperbiconization world where we have much less central planning because it's you, they just can't get the funding that they do at the moment with a money printer they have to obtain the their um their taxes sort of voluntarily because you you, you just can't tax as effectively um so they kind of they, they have to be more hands off uh and then combine that with uh a populace that has more savings so they they've that their their um their purchasing power hasn't been eroded over time like we see with our fiat standard uh they've got more savings and hopefully the savings are increasing in value over time so the longer you're sort of sitting on it the more capital you've got to play with for your future research projects so you can sort of afford to take a bit more of those risks because you're not uh you're not having to desperately cling on to every last cent of purchasing power you you, you can think you can plan further forward into the future and sort of try and chart where the ball is going and how you could how you can position yourself for that further into the future and then if you think about I, mean, I don't want to moan about taxes because people you think people think whatever they like about it and, and the size of the state and so on but if we really look at the numbers and if you try and think about how much economic power is being bled off by these states if you think of a normal sort of um economic loop of you know you've got you you go to work and you earn your your paycheck and then you bleed off you know 20 to 40 percent in western economies in income tax that's gone straight away and then you know you buy stuff and there's so up to 20 percent ish tax on that you know there's every layer of transaction in the economy more and more and more and more and more is bled off and you could argue that's fair enough you know they build the hospitals and stuff and fine maybe but then think about how much they're getting bled off in that process and then that's still not enough and there's chronic money printing going on on top of that which is your completely involuntary tax and all of that funding which is so much that even the taxes don't cover what it needs to do and there has to be a deficit so people who aren't born yet have to have to contribute to funding what we want to fund today um with all that it's still uh well it's it's just it's just not enough it's it's a staggering amount of uh human sort of work that is bled off and fed into the central planning system where they then decide where it's going to be spent which is almost by definition going to be manual investment because if it was uh, if it was desired by the market then the market would work on trying to fulfill that need so they only really fund things that the market hasn't said it wants yet and so it's just waste upon waste upon waste or waste so if you kind of get rid of that let's call that say 80 percent of of work is is bled off and just wasted and in very inefficiently used so we've got that back and then what you um what you earn for yourself and sort of put to one side and save kind of preserves its purchasing power and hopefully grows a little bit over time you end up with a, a massively more wealthy world and um you know in the in the through the lens of the like the aerospace corporations or something when we talk about the plane stuff when they've got that capital ready to deploy and they're not being manipulated by government sort of putting the levers and changing the levers all over the place i don't know what what might we achieve what how far could we go i i don't know it's fun to it's limitless about. it's limitless i mean uh, i was going to ask you also about the um, you know for truly technological scientific and technological advancements innovation um i think you need uh, also the the foundation or the you need structural changes within the educational system you need uh, free spirits. Uh, you need, you know, not only, you know, uh, systematically indoctrinated universities, you know, or or uh, whatever schools these people come from, but uh, I think the the real technological progress and advancement happen because, you know, as you know, I I I, I truly I truly believe Elon Musk, for example. I mean, he has great ideas. You know, he's really smart, clever. He's he has got a you know a, a beautiful imagination and and and. Uh, but I don't know him personally, so I I can only imagine that he had the the the, the what do you call it the the possibility that and the power to you know to hire the best people the best brains uh, within his in industry, you know uh, who can think and uh, conceptualize you know and develop outside of the box which we've been growing up with. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying, like. Uh, there, uh, I mean, when, if we zoom out, what do you think? What kind of structural changes or 
uh, transformation need to happen to really go usher into a new, you know, paradigm shift, whatever you call it, evolution? Well, if we if we consider the economic stuff that we just discussed, if we you know check that box and say that's fixed, that's done, and you know, that's already a massive leap by itself, but let's call that one done. Uh, education side is probably a good one. Yeah, I mean we you could frame it as we're sort of indoctrinated into this this fixed way of thinking but uh we we probably don't get the most out of out of the kids and and the and the minds as they grow up and develop because you're not so free to explore the things that are personally interesting to you and i understand like i think all of this stuff probably originally came from a good place like we want to give our children a a good base layer understanding of how the world works and you know some mathematics and some physics and you know all that the, the basic stuff I, I think it probably started from a good place who knows what it is now you know everything's gone corrupted over the recent decades um but we with that it's, it's sort of it's again it's classic central planning stuff versus free market stuff and the free market in in the world of uh um you know, intelligence or, or developing an intellect. People have an affinity for different directions and different uh, different um, fields. And with with more freedom to explore that, like everyone kind of feels a draw in a particular direction or another one. And some people really like chemistry, whereas I can't do chemistry at all. And some people really like physics and I really like design stuff. I like uh, sort of figuring out how things went together or, or what, you know the the higher level mechanics stuff about how how could we here is a problem set in front of me here's a number of tools we can use to work with how can we what's the solution with the tools we have to solve that problem and you know what are we close to but we don't have quite yet and then if i can if i can build that and i'm you know missing one piece or something then that could be my output that goes into the research sector to say you know i need something for this one small problem can you guys work on that area that would be my market signal i suppose if you guys can work on that area, then we can unlock, you know, supersonic jet planes or something. I just can't solve that bit by myself. But with everyone kind of like corralled into the same uh, school of thought, but also like experience and and so on, you lose that like um, that that beautiful complexity of all the different all the different minds that could be applied to to the problem and to, and to look at the world through their own different way and unique viewpoints and kind of follow follow the thread to whatever they're drawn drawn towards everyone feels a draw to something or other and that's sort of the signal of you know that's where you're best applied that's where you can produce the most value if you're genuinely interested in that area you can go in there and explore it to a degree that no one else would bother with because no one else thinks it's interesting you just like your one weird little thing um and that's what really moves things forward um and we don't really get that i think you don't even really get to think about that until you get to adulthood and even then probably most people most people are stuck being you know, wage slaves, they go to their job that they hate, that they, they they can learn to tolerate it and they have their one holiday a year or something and then and then eventually you, you die. Whereas when people reach a, a, a level of financial security, you're able to say, no, I don't want to take that job. Actually, I think I'll keep looking for another couple of months to find the right thing. Or actually, I'm only, I only want to work three days a week because I want to explore this this one little thing. And it might seem like a dull hobby or something, but you know the the Wright brothers started tinkering with their bikes and stuff in their in their spare time, and now we have airliners uh, off the result of that research. So hopefully, under a a sound money standard and unsteedable sound money standard, we might get more of that. We might kind of free people up to start thinking about the things they're really interested in and unlock all that brain power that's currently locked away working on their job that they absolutely hate and they're, they're not they don't have the time or the space or the mental space to apply themselves to kind of what they're called towards I mean, what what might we be missing out on i mean I, i'm not saying it's going to be hover cars and teleporters five years into post bitcoin but, but maybe i don't know the guy who's who's got that idea might be stuck working on something really tedious that he just doesn't even get time to think about it so who knows yeah, who knows? Um, I mean, I've, I've for me, there's there's no limits. I mean, um, you you know Jeff Booth, uh, most probably, you know, uh, the, the, why deflation is the key to an abundant future, uh, his book, and um, he that's what he always you know preaching about. You know, it's like the deflationary technologies, 
um, it's just beyond our imagination, probably our comprehension, what, what could be possible uh, uh, within that framework you were, you've been talking about, you know, like sound money, uh, no central planning, you know, creative minds coming out, uh, people, you know, working less and less, you know, for, for living or survival, you know, maybe three, four days, whatever, voluntarily, but the rest of the, of the time, um, you know, anybody can, can go into any direction they want. Would it be, I don't know, uh, psychological, scientific, technological, um, uh, uh, teaching, uh, researching, um, I mean, it just, uh, what, I think what, what, this is what, what's, uh, what what makes me sad a little bit, you know, in the, uh, if I think about the last hundred years at least, uh, it's just so much potential lost, you know, uh, through yeah. through the fiat system. So much, I mean, it's so much suffering, so much pain, so much, um, yeah, lost, you know, uh, so much creativity lost, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, this is, um, and I know we we can we can make this happen, and 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 because you know, technology also for me is essentially what is this technology is for you know it's bringing humanity or bringing comfort you know more comfort uh more fun <laughs> more freedom to humanity right and more efficiency um so um so i'm a huge fan you know of jeff booth because uh, he he really nails it every time he he breaks it down he he zooms out he he can explain things uh have you read his book yeah yeah i, I you probably it. yeah <laughs> you listen awesome. to probably lots of interviews so um, I don't know what is necessary. Is it is it the tipping point that I mean we we don't have that yet. We don't have the hyper Bitcoinized world. But I think once the tipping point is reached, and uh, let's let's take for example El Salvador because this is something I, I really love talking about because it uh, I mean the things that <laughs> the the rate of speed of 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 improvement you know of um, economical improvement uh, technological improvement. Um, people coming back, you know, the brains are coming back, the safety and security has come back. So, um, uh, and I think at, in one of my episodes, I, I talked to a couple of people and I said, you know, I mean, if I were Buk Bukele, um, I would, I would probably do even more. And I would, I would, uh, I would, I would make sure that, you know, the best people come inside and, you know, give them the freedom to, to explore, to research, to uh, facilitate, to develop. Um, is that something, I mean, you can think about, like, do you sometimes think about like uh, one or two countries, for example, as a, you know, as a lead ro role, like let's take El Salvador. Do you, do you see El Salvador as a place where uh, these kind of things could, could um, accelerate Um yeah, in well, any let's, let's hope so, right? I mean, it's it's really interesting to watch it play out, and uh, I hope they they continue to capitalize on the kind of lead they've managed to establish. Um, I don't know how it will go. I'm really optimistic, and I love hearing about what's what's going on and how uh, sort of the mindset is shifting and the mood is shifting, and people are feeling more optimistic and all the stuff you outlined. They have a real potential to be the kind of the the uh the first the first outpost of the sort of the bitcoin world i mean i don't know if you've seen uh ray dalio's diagram of the sort of the the changing um empire cycle and you you know you loop through uh, i forget who was before uh the uk but there was the uk and then they sort of got kind of usurped by the us and so there's these big arcs and then his, on his diagram he's drawn the next arc to be china but i think that's wrong i think the next arc is uh some some label it as bitcoin i would think of it as the internet in general of which bitcoin is the currency and sort of like the the nation if you like that represents it but the, it's it's the world really because it's all humans interconnected um and you kind of see it in bitcoin as even today i mean that we've got our own money uh, that can't be messed about with from the fiat world really uh you've got a particular culture to it you've got um an economy developing around it so this is like a, a non-physical uh new global ruling empire i suppose that we're in the very very early days of like it's just the curve is just starting to move up um and i think el salvador has a chance to be the like the 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 kicking off point or like the first footstep in that in that change if they if if Bikeli doesn't you know 
go authoritarian crazy or something or get voted out and they just undo everything a couple of years from now or something if they kind of stay on the path they're on they could really be like um the first the first the first step in that in that in that transition and it's a really powerful position to be in i mean like he if if assuming bitcoin doesn't go down to zero from here assuming we're in this cycle is the same as all the other cycles and we're about to start an up curve you know and in about a year's time he's going to look like an absolute genius um and the rest of the world is going to be sort of scrambling to catch up and then we move into the, like the nation state competition fomo stage of the game which could be really interesting um but i hope that they continue the path they're on because it's it's a really positive one and to go back to Bitcoin, sort of Bitcoiners and culture and things, we mentioned before about how we've had this sort of century of of wastage, I suppose, and, and sort of lost time. And I wonder whether in the history books this would be looked at as a sort of a, a weird dark ages of sort, because although we had Wi-Fi and stuff, we also had this massive sort of economic drain all the time and everyone was sort of becoming more and more depressed and everything became corrupted and you know, politics and food and science and everything is all ruined um whether it looked back on as a dark ages but now that we have bitcoin and people are kind of starting to move to that nation if you will uh you know a bit like crossing the atlantic to go to the to america in its early days people are starting to make that move and the people who have done it you can see already the people who've been around for a cycle or two are becoming sort of comfortably wealthy i mean it's not about everyone buying lambos and whatever but becoming comfortably wealthy enough that you can start to pursue things that you are genuinely interested in uh you start to see a lot more people interested in philosophy and things thinking long term about the future they're able to pursue their passions and interests and from there is where you get innovation things start to move forwards uh, i so if you think about the the kind of person that this um this process kind of builds or creates you end up with someone who uh is distrusting of authority i suppose um independently wealthy at least comfortable enough to not have to go and work at their wage slave job on monday you know they may still do so because they want to stack more but they don't have to so they're doing it by choice um they're thinking about the things that they find interesting in the world and 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 sort of expanding collective knowledge there uh and I, I, you just start to see this culture sort of start to emerge oh and they are becoming more wealthy over time so they're going to have increasing influence over the world as as bitcoin continues to not fail and disappear and die these people are becoming more entrenched oh and they're they're fully okay with massive volatility so they 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 have been uh trained by these volatile cycles to just sit back relax hold make sure that you are um secure enough that you can weather all these storms whereas you look at the fiat world there's a storm where like uh you know the stock market drops by 20 percent or something the world collapses everything is over no one can withstand that at all whereas in bitcoin we'll be like 70 percent you know fine whatever I'm, that's that's no problem so you you kind of breed these people with massive resilience mm -hmm. and distrust of authority and security and freedom to work on interesting things and like that, that's the world you want to build that's what you want to establish and it's already happening and we're only 14 years in or something it's mm. going to be awesome <laughs> oh yeah it's going to be beyond amazing um i think as i said you know i think it's it's really beyond the at least the average person's imagination and comprehension what is possible already today uh, i'm convinced of that it, there is no yeah. limit there is no like technological obstacles or anything it just needs to be the the foundation or the the, the parameter what do you call it the, the conditions have to be yeah. have to be fulfilled otherwise we can't go forward and i mean I uh, and 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 you know it's not as you, you know as we we, we talk, talk mostly you know, about aviation and, but it's like every sector we can think of like <laughs> will it be energy medicine healing uh i don't know transportation um anything we can imagine it's I think it's overdue to be honest with you I think uh it's uh we we missed something and uh and humanity has been suffering and um and de been deprived of and been stolen mm. from actually uh it's it's it it has been systematic theft what's been going on on a grand scale on a massive scale you know especially intellectually psychologically emotionally and uh spiritually and technologically mm. <laughs> it's um have you ever set off in your car driving somewhere and you've accidentally left the uh 
we call it the handbrake, but the emergency brake, the e-brake, if you left it on a little bit and you only realize when you're halfway down the road or something that you, you <laughs> yeah. need to drop and let off and the car goes <laughs> off again. In the well, beginning, yeah. we've, we've done that and the brake has been like 80% on for a century and we've been driving down the road and you're thinking, oh my God, I've got to get to work. It's taking me forever. What's this weird smell? What's my going God. on? And, yeah. and then, then you finally drop the handle and the car just works properly again. Like, I mean, I don't want to get too utopian because I think we, it's easy to get carried away and excited about how awesome everything will be. Uh, and I, I kind of also worry about that end state because if you think of uh, people who kind of survived this transition as sort of like soldiers or something, everyone in, in the war, everyone's thinking how great it's going to be when they get home from the war. But the problem is that, uh, you know, you enjoy that for a little while uh, and then, then you get bored because you've been built for this sort of conflict and you've been built for this, um, you know, resolving, resolving problems and being under stress and so on. You, you can't really enjoy uh, just, it's not just like, oh, we're going to, I'm going to go and build my citadel and, and raise some a family and some cows or something. And then that's it game over. I can kick back and relax and everything's done. Uh, I think there will be, well, what other things might the Bitcoin mindset be applied to what other problems? And there are plenty of problems in the world that need solving. It's interesting to think about where this mindset might be reoriented to once like the money is fixed, which is a huge fight in itself, but we will get there. I'm confident because there's enough people awake to this now. Uh, the problems of the existing system are so bad that they're not really ignorable anymore. So even if Bitcoin, the protocol as we know it today, fails somehow, the same people will just go, right, okay, what, what went wrong with that one? How can we tweak it? What, and we'll, we'll go again because we know the problem is there and we know we want to fix it and we've got enough people who want to do it that it can happen. So even if it's not that exact protocol, well, something else will come about. But once the money is fixed, what next? I think we will find ourselves applying to other other things. And um, if you look at how much has been achieved, even this far, just in the Bitcoin. That's world, what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look at that. I mean, look look at the glory yeah. of, of humanity. I mean, what the still, even though under all this pressure and, and this manipulation and 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 corruption and fraud and and you know and criminal you know monetary system, we still have somehow achieved right a level yeah. of. <laughs> Well, it's by building a system that can't be fucked with, basically. Mm -hmm. So you just learn what what are the. I think that's what really uh, inspired me on Bitcoin is is the resilience that's built into it and the mindset of the people who work on it and who understand it. That you understand how your enemy is going to be coming after you and design it so like that just doesn't work. You can't do that. The only thing that works is sort of positive cooperation, and um, you know taking that that kind of solution style. And the, all the intellectual firepower that's been built up around it in the Bitcoin space, and and you know, even, not even the the code guys, but you know, the, all the philosophy and you know everything, the whole space, taking that, and then what what happens when that's reapplied to something else, some other problem that could be solved? I think we, we're going to see it's like the the e break thing. Once that eighty percent e break gets dropped down, and we can we can finally get going again, we're going to go really really far. It's I, I hate to get too utopian because you end up just saying everything's going to be great and it's going to be an awesome time. But I like to be a bit more grounded and realistic. But it's maybe it's Jeff Booth's thing. It's really hard to even imagine what it will look like because we've only known living under this exactly sort yeah. of broken system. Yeah. Yeah, we never, I mean, we never experienced it, right? I mean, I mean, you know, when Safedan talks about the La Belle Epoque or the gold standard, like what kind of fundamental like uh, uh, technologies, you know, were developed within the La Belle Epoque or whatever he calls it, the gold standard. It's, and then from then it was just sort of, he, I mean, that's what Safedan says. Uh, to a certain degree, he's right. It's sort of an extension of what has been developed, you know, further on, you know, on every level. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, uh, for me, I mean, I, I have, uh, probably I've been to too many rabbit holes. I mean, for me, it's nothing, nothing utopian about it. It's just the logical, you know, next step, right? So, uh, Owen, like, what, what kind of time frame? Or what, what, what would you say? What kind of conditions? Because uh, you probably know also Samson Mao of uh, Jan Three, who is trying to, you know, nation state Bitcoin adoption accelerate <laughs> hyper Bitcoinization. Mm -hmm. That's the mission of Jan Three. I mean, do you see? a path uh, like a realistic path within the next few years or do you think it's something we cannot really calculate like could it be like next 10 20 30 years or do you see something like like something that needs to happen like a condition and then it it all you know it's a chain reaction 
Yeah, I mean, it's a difficult like balance to to envision, isn't it? Because to us who are already kind of on the other side, we've already moved across the Atlantic and we're living in the the new world now. And we're like, well, guys, come across. It's better here. Just we can just there's, there's room for everyone. We can just go, and it will just we can get on with life. Um, it's so blindingly obvious, but the I think it will take longer than we think or hope. Uh, and partly, I think that's because it takes a lot of uh, humility to be able to really get bitcoin and sort of like accept it and this is why it's so hard to explain to people who don't really understand it because it just sounds like a religious cult or something but it's because it's you have to really be willing to kind of let go of everything that you understood before and look at things with completely fresh eyes blank sheet of paper how should it work what makes sense you know in in economics for example forget everything that you learned before assume that was all junk and start again and then build from there um and i don't think you know Western governments have the humility to do that, at least for quite a while. So I think we're going to see this sort of rotation of power, and people like to describe it as the global south, and places like El Salvador, the places we've, been, we've really like struggled under the current regimes, and who uh, haven't they haven't they've been under this sort of yoke the whole time. They've not been able to kind of like really carve their own path, and there's a tool there now to do that. And they're they've been so screwed over by the existing system that they're the ones who are willing and able to look at it, whereas. The US and, and Europe and the UK are so wedded to their existing systems and it's uh, so um, entrenched in them. I don't think they they have the humility to be able to say, what if we did everything differently? What if we've been wrong this whole time? Uh, and, you know, governments are made of, of people, politicians, and so naturally it will kind of switch out over time as, as people get replaced or die off or whatever. Um, and you're seeing a few of them pop up now, like Pierre Polyever in the in Canada. Uh, the, he's he seems to be a good voice so far. And obviously yeah, there are a couple LA. of candidates, even in Argentina, Javier Milay. You know, it's like mm. yeah. <laughs> so like it, it's, the tide is starting to turn, but it's a long, long way away. I think. And weirdly, I kind of hope that it, it you do have this rotation because I think it's time for those those countries to to have a fair crack of the whip. You know. Um, I think in the West we've sort of squandered it, and it's no one person's fault. It's just, it's just you know, we've just gone down the wrong path, and now we're we're so far down that no one's even able to contemplate that this might be the wrong direction. Let alone contemplate maybe we should go back and go a different way. Um, I think it will, it will. I mean, it's going to be ugly in the transitional transitionary yeah. period. Oh, is and then if we look at it in Bitcoin cycle terms of about four years, a halving cycle kind of thing. Um, it's not going to be this next one. I mean, assuming Bitcoin doesn't go to zero from here, like we said earlier, Bukele is going to look like an absolute hero in the next sort of bull run if it goes past 100 or something. And they they significantly increase their their um, wealth as a country from off the result of his Bitcoin bet, as the IMF likes to say. And that's going to start making other people look. But then there's going to be another drawdown cycle and there's going to be all the... Uh, the uh, obituaries and the news and things like like we saw with B. Kelly because he kind of invested in near the top for El Salvador and they've ridden it out down and now they're going to ride it up. So, you know, it's not going to happen in the next one cycle. Two cycles seems like plausible, but probably unrealistic because just how slow these oil tankers are to kind of change course. So maybe three at the soonest, which puts us at sort of 12, 12 ish years or something at the yeah. earliest, I think. But then again, on the other hand, Bitcoin is competing against these utterly crumbling fiat systems. Exactly, where things yeah. are so bad that it's it's becoming obvious to even ordinary people who don't care about boring economic stuff like us nerds that it's not working. And but I think they're not. Um, things aren't bad enough that they're willing to throw the whole thing out yet. I think not yet. When not things yet. get really bad, but it could happen. Come I mean, in and know, say like black swan events simultaneously. You know, maybe. I don't know. The governments are going to come in with CBDCs and things, and they're going to say, oh, well, the old currency system didn't work because X, Y, Z, and you can't trust Bitcoin because that's too risky and no one controls it yet. So here's our thing in the meantime. And I think most people will go, oh, yeah, that sounds fine, whatever. And so that will buy you know another decade or something. We've not been, in the West especially, we've not been burned badly enough to just reject anything the government gives us like they do in, mm -hmm. in uh, you know um, places that have seen proper hyperinflation. So we're in the West, we're probably in for another you know, another couple of cycles of of them trying to keep the fiat system rolling before we can really break free and and sail away on the Bitcoin lifeboat kind of a thing. But that doesn't mean that the non-Western countries, the South, if you will, has to follow that same course. I think they're gonna 
they're really going to get the jump start and yeah and oh, then Africa. we'll see a really interesting yeah. world because yeah. there's a well yeah africa's a great example there's a whole bunch of minds there that are not being able to be applied to the more complex problems of of the world they're just stuck you know living day to day and if adoption there and also because poverty is so high like it actually doesn't take a lot to move the needle really like they they can a little change makes a much bigger difference there and if you can boost all of those people out of real poverty into relative security then they can all start applying themselves to solving big problems in the world uh gosh, i don't know <laughs> you have to think so far ahead it's um it's really hard to picture what things yeah it is hard yeah like. but it's uh i yeah, just don't know very uh, no well said well said uh the realistic scenarios i mean that's that's how it definitely could play out but you know i always I always anticipate like you know something you know some like simultaneous like things going on and then uh, it just it just it just uh, you know takes takes on its own journey um oh and i love i loved our conversation i, I hope we can continue this uh next time sometime in the near future um yeah. is there something like makes you excited right now because i mean i know you you can't talk like what kind of uh field you're going into but but is there something like um makes you really excited like uh, development would it be lightning or i don't know <laughs> i think lightning is interesting because what i really like about lightning versus bitcoin is you've got these these two systems that work together but they're they're sort of well, they're sort of opposed in 90 degrees so they they have different trade-offs and they work in different ways and lightning for example you can be a lot more reckless you can try new stuff you don't have to keep the entire like uh it's not one system for the entire world that has to like remain running at all costs. You know, failure is not an option type thing. Uh, you can mess around and try stuff. And if it breaks, it's not, it's not that big a deal because what matters is the connection between the two channel peers. It doesn't have to be everyone playing by the same rules. So there's a lot of potential for experimentation there. And you're seeing lots of people start dicking around and seeing what they can do. And, you know, I have some ideas in that area myself about different things we can do with it. It's, you know, it's, it's a tool. Uh, and the open source nature of all of this stuff means that you can get all those minds, like we talked about earlier, starting to apply themselves to, well, what can we do now we have this tool? Uh, so that's that's particularly interesting. Um, it's also interesting to watch, I mean, I don't know if it's excited about, but it's interesting to watch the discussions about ossification right now. So we've seen some some turmoil in uh, in the community recently over the ordinals and inscription stuff and various soft forks and proposals like OpVault and stuff that might come in. And then how, how we go about integrating that stuff into the core protocol, whether we do or not. And I, that's really interesting to see to me because some people just want the new stuff and that's fine. And some people want to be more cautious and that's fine. But what the, the like the emergent behavior that we're seeing where it it's proving time and time again, is really hard to change this stuff. It's really hard to change core protocol, which is exactly what you want to see for the world's money. I, mean, I think personally, it's more than just money. I really like Jason Lowry's kind of thing about it being power. And I think looking at it only as money is a limited lens and it can be, it's a much more flexible and powerful tool than that. It's a bit like the, the sats are like the atoms of a different, a different physical plane or something, you know, think about the atoms and all the things we do with atoms as a general concept in, in the physical world. And now you have something in a different plane that's not the physical plane that has its own fixed rules that can't be changed, but everyone can access. And then the things we might build with it. I mean, it's really hard to even wrap your head around because it's not, it's a different way of doing things altogether. But the concept of this sort of shared plane, which is the, the Bitcoin protocol and network and stuff, that I think is really exciting and no one's looking at that stuff really yet, but probably because it's just so abstract and money is already a big enough thing to try and solve. Um, that I think interesting things will be done there in the future. And that's where, that's where my mind, you know, wanders when <laughs> that's where the shower thoughts are and things. No, I totally agree with you. Yeah. And the roots, you know, it, it has to be, that's why it's called immutable. It, it needs to be immutable. You know, that's the root of the money, you know, and anything else would it be, you know, uh, L2, L3 or whatever, uh, L4, <laughs> It's, uh, it's, I mean, if we can learn out of this, you know, this, um, this gimmicks, <laughs> I call them, you know, the ordinals and it, um, that's great. You know, if we can like learn and, and, and apply those, the knowledge or the trial and error into, you know, into real technology for, for, you know, for further layers, that's great, mm -hmm. but I don't know, I'm not technical. So, 
Um, I better shut up about that. So but, <laughs> no, for me, it's really important. The, the essence of money, you know, that's, that's, uh, we need, to, <laughs> this is the, 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 you know, the most important thing that probably in the in human history that yeah. we are, you know, we just, uh, we are about to, you know, um, yeah. I mean, we, we always joke about, uh, you know, Bitcoin going to the moon, but I think of this thing as sort of our generation's moon mission, maybe. Maybe that's a bit silly, but I think it it stacks up to me because it takes, it's it's a it's a really important goal. It's really quite inspiring. Uh, it takes an awful lot of engineering like prowess to be able to do it. And failure is not an option. Like none of us are willing to say, oh, it didn't work. Okay, I guess we'll give up and go back to fiat slavery. Like it's, it's not going to happen. We are going to get there. And that's why it's just the, the most interesting and important thing in the world to be working on right now. I, I love being in this space. I felt so lost and confused before discovering all this. And now it's like, we, we're going to the moon. We're going to the yeah. moon. We, we're going to do it. I mean, it's hard, but we're going to. And, and beyond the moon, I would yeah. say. Yeah. <laughs> why stop there? <laughs> well, um, I really enjoyed our conversation, Oren. Um Anything we we should have mentioned? Anything final thoughts? Anything you wanted to say, or I should have asked? I know I wanted to ask you about the submarines and so the nuclear engine, uh, <laughs> nuclear powered vehicles. But now this is a whole topic for itself. But is there anything like important that you sh we should have mentioned? No, I think we covered a lot of good stuff. Maybe yeah. another time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, and where can people find you? Is there besides Twitter? Um, no, you can go and follow me on Twitter for uh, sometimes. Interesting technical stuff, sometimes shit posting, you know, uh, that general mixture of the two. Uh, every now and again, I write an article in Bitcoin magazine and I'll post links on there. So, yeah, start with that. that. Yeah. But, yeah. And you should, you should definitely you know, go on other podcasts. Um, is that your first podcast? Yeah. <laughs> well, great. <laughs> Congrats, congratulations. But I think you should go, <laughs> you know, to Daniel Prince, a good friend of ours, you know, or others, um, if you're open, you know, for that. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. I definitely. Love speaking to Bitcoiners. Yeah. So uh, thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge and wisdom. It's a fascinating conversation and hope you know we can repeat this again. Okay. <laughs> That's a pleasure. I look forward All right. to it. Oh, and take care. See you. Bye.